So uh, welcome to uh, this first uh, impact showcase for Catalyst 2030. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Patton. Um, I see many familiar faces joining us today uh, and really great to have you with us. Um, and uh, I work for the uh, Catalyst 2030 Secretariat in the donor relations team. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined today by a wonderful uh, lineup of guests who are here to talk uh, a little bit about uh, their part in this, uh, their movement for Catalyst 2030. Um, but first of all, um, I'd really like to hand over uh, with great thanks um, to Francois Benici, um, who is the director of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship and head of social innovation at the World Economic Forum, uh, who is also a Catalyst 2030 governing council member uh, and Francois, we're delighted to have you here today to moderate us in this exciting uh, impact session over the next hour. So over to you, Francois. Thank you so much, Matt, and welcome everyone uh, to uh, an exciting uh, opportunity to bring a broader community of people who are dedicated and work in the space uh, of social change together, together to bring us together uh, for Catalyst's first impact showcase. So Matt, thank you to you and the Catalyst Secretary and all the Catalyst members that really drive its strategy and its initiative to create this space for us today, bringing together so many new faces as well as uh, some uh, old friends. Uh, so first of all, why, why are we here? Um, the aim really of this event is to try and uh, showcase how uh, the philanthropic, the private sector and public sectors can work together to create an enabled environment for the social economy. That's quite a broad framing. And I think what it means to all of us is that we have challenges in our work, the work that we do, the institutions we run, the resources we have, uh, the opportunities uh, we have in our work uh, has remained to many degrees in, in silos. Uh, and we know we all need to work together, but sometimes that's uh, quite hard. Uh, and I just encourage us all to uh, keep our institutions in our back pockets, but come here today with an open mind around, well, what, what do we see uh, in what's happening in the world? How do things need to change? How do we need to change as individuals? And then how do we bring our institutions along into some of those changes? Um, uh, Catalyst 2030 is creating the conditions uh, for this enabling environment. How does it do that? Uh, it does that by uh, explaining, first of all, what Catalyst 2030 is as a global movement uh, of social entrepreneurs, of partners, of private sector and governments uh, working together around collaboration and towards systemic change uh, to try and help accelerate our progress towards the sustainable development goals. It's a bottom up movement. It's a distributed movement. It's a collaborative movement. And it has members across the world who drive the priorities of that movement. Um, in, in a way, today is, is a little bit of the Catalyst 2030 theory of change happening in practice. We're trying to generate an enabling ecosystem. And what does that mean? It means, and it starts with understanding, right? It starts with understanding each other. It starts with uh, looking at different ways uh, of working together. Um, my co-author uh, on a book I, I wrote around systemic work, Cynthia Rayner recently wrote a, uh, a piece around radical collaboration with Catherine Mulligan. It, it really does require us to uh, be honest about the ways that we're stuck uh, and, and the ways to move forward. Uh, currently, um, Catalyst 2030 is developing the profile and understanding of what social entrepreneurs do, the increasing importance in their role and their voice. Uh, to actually support the scale and responsiveness of a funding ecosystem for social enterprises, to improve the policy frameworks, sustainability practices at country levels, uh, and also to really emphasize the community's foundational role uh, in realizing a, a broader mission. Um, currently, uh, the way the funding paradigm works, uh, the way development paradigm works, uh, heavily favors uh, established large entities. And yet we all know we uh, need to drive and distribute power, decision-making authority and funding to those closer to where the change happens. Uh, and when we uh, kind of have been debating and understand the narratives that are, have been emerging over the last few years in the funding sector around uh, distribution, around power, around decolonization, around long-term perspectives, around trust-based philanthropy, uh, and ultimately around how do we fund systemic change, 
it has to start uh, from the bottom up. So that's what Catalyst has given me an opportunity to, to engage in and why you know, I personally have been such a supporter uh, of the Catalyst Network. At the World Economic Forum, uh, we have a strategic alliance with Catalyst 2030 to really bring the voice and representative of uh, social entrepreneurs beyond our own community um, into the engagements we have uh, with uh, private sector and with government. So I hope that gives you a bit of a flavor and you know, really to, to bring that to life, uh, what is critical about uh, doing this kind of work uh, is that many of you know, we work with relatively small to medium organizations around the world. And often that uh, size and that scale is critical for local based trust and, and hands-on work, but it is also an obstacle to really raising the voice uh, and raising perspectives and being in positions of visibility uh, and, uh, and power. Uh, and so the power of networks is really a critical uh, first step uh, in, in really becoming advocates for change. So you know, to really bring this to life and, and get out of the conceptual talk, uh, I'm really joined by a, an amazing group of uh, individuals. Uh, I will introduce them just quickly now, and then we'll, we'll get to, to, to learn each of them uh, and what they do and will bring to this conversation. Uh, John Mugo, Dr. John Mugo will start. He is the, a, a really network member, which is the uh, Regional Education uh, Learning Initiative um, and also the CEO of Zizi Afrique uh, Foundation. Um, John, I'm going to hand over to you for a minute, but also to say we're, we're joined by three other incredible people, uh, Dr. Joyce Malombe from Wellspring Philanthropic Fund, uh, Dr. Wamuyu Mahinda, the managing partner and convener of Collaborative Value Partners, and also the Africa, uh, uh, the chairperson of the Catalyst 2030 Kenya chapter, and Alexandra van der Ploeg, head of corporate social responsibility at SAP. Uh, Alexandra and Joyce are incidentally also Catalyst 2030 awardees. And for those of you who don't know about the Catalyst Awards, it's where uh, Catalyst has turned the table on actors uh, you know, of power and these larger institutions giving awards, but really giving awards from the perspective uh, of proximate leaders and social uh, entrepreneurs to say, who's helping us build this ecosystem? Who, how do we recognize the behaviors and the engagements and the partnerships that feel like true partnerships? So for those that have been awardees, they're here because uh, we believe there are uh, true actors in helping us build a, an ecosystem that will uh, allow social entrepreneurs to thrive. So uh, thanks to you all for being here today, a very special panel. Uh, and I'm going to start, uh, really start at, at the beginning. And, and John, I'm going to hand over to you uh, for a presentation and a case study uh, of uh, really and, and, and the work uh, that you've all been doing um, to build this network of organizations to ensure inclusive learning uh, for all children in East Africa. So kind of both the, the, the story of you know, the organization, but also the power of a network and the relationships you've had, uh, both with government and policy, but also with funders, uh, and how those relationships have helped to build an ongoing ecosystem uh, to, to, to do this work over time. So John, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Francois, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for such a powerful introduction, Francois. I've picked two things. One around the radical collaboration, and which in this case of really is fueled by trust based philanthropy. Uh, thank a Wellspring Philanthropic Fund. I'm here uh, uh, talking to you from Nairobi, but joined by a couple of really members from across Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. And I thank them for bringing me and bringing, braving this evening. Uh, here in East, in, in East Africa. We are truly thankful because this year, I think, has been a great one. First, celebrating five years of rally. And when we were just about to do so, then the Catalyst 2030 Award came. And uh, Joyce was there on our behalf uh, receiving that award. We celebrated here uh, as though uh, it was Wellspring. Uh, we, we, we were in, indeed from Wellspring. Uh, the, what I'm going to speak to is our story of this regional education learning initiative, a collaborative of more than 80 um, civil society organizations spread across Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And uh, you will forgive me if I speak some of these things uh, sounding uh, from the heart, 
but it's because our journey really has been one story that we wish uh, to tell. And being here today, I think is a highlight moment, the privilege of addressing such a, an esteemed uh, audience. So I'm going to share my reflections and a presentation in three parts. First is the journey of rally and where we are, we are coming from. Then second will be around rally's impact. And then I'll end with five reflections based on uh, what we have seen is possible and what we believe is possible. The next slide. So when we began in 2017, the context was that we were little many organizations supported by various funders. And one funder, um, uh, uh, Wellspring, uh, thought that we were really islands of excellence that had no connection. So before then, we were disconnected, doing similar work around improving learning outcomes, addressing indeed such a complex um, um, challenge in, in, in our context here in East Africa and across Sub-Saharan Africa, but hardly having any unified voice, hardly knowing each other or talking to each other. And that journey really, I think, um, uh, was really to be a hard one in that kind of disconnection. The second thing was that uh, this is space where the bigger organizations, international organizations really um, have the competitive edge, having more resources and thereby also the possibility of attracting more resources. So it was like this vicious cycle, um, a, a kind of structured marginalization of smaller local organizations. And we really didn't have agency. If I were to reflect on my own case as John, but also Zizi Afrik then, um, we were not able to attract any big funding because you look at our history, you look at uh, what we have been able to manage. And of course the international organizations, powerful as they were, would come um, get the funding, get the connection to government. And then the next thing, would be to poach John Mogo from Zizi Afrique to work for the larger organizations and thereby weakening local agency. And the third was that we realized each of us would go to government at their own time. When I'm stepping in to share my evidence, someone else, you know, Moses from APHRC or John Kalage from El uh, Haki Elimu or Goretti from Uezo, Uganda would be walking out, you, you know, and we thought that with that kind of disconnected voice, it was not possible to engage government and getting government to listen. So uh, that also applied to evidence in that our scale was largely small and, and thereby then I would not have that size of evidence needed to get government to listen. Next slide, please. So the journey of rally began in 2017 we came together, uh, thank Wellspring, brought us into one room and told us, guys, uh, the door is locked. You figure out how working together looks like because the journey is long. The issue we are addressing is complex. Learning has to be the fuel, that uh, uh, palm oil with which we, we, we have to eat the, the, the impact that is needed. And at first, personally, I didn't understand uh, what Joyce was talking about. And uh, in 2018, we were able to, after many meetings, uh, define our values uh, that included trust, learning, respect, collaboration, and empowerment. They may sound just like simple values, simple words, but it was a long journey getting there. And in 2019 was when now we could start feeling the the vision of really that is based on three pillars, a, a knowledge hub, policy influencing and member transformation. And it was now becoming real. For many of us, it was practical. And 2020, uh, of course, COVID comes. We were able now to hold hands together and uh, strengthen each other's resilience through the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns. And we were in many virtual meetings together. So that journey uh, through COVID that would have been very lonesome was really now uh, all already weathered by a network where we were able to, uh, to, to, to strengthen each other. And to a big uh, also uh, um, 
um, amazement. We were able to establish the first program uh, that, that is funded uh, for really the assessment of life skills and values in East Africa through COVID that is now celebrating uh, two years um, uh, into it. In 2021, we realized that um, getting to enhance the leadership capacity aspects of uh, fundraising, learning together on how to do these complex things. Um, that journey we have worked together uh, and, 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 and really we, as we see now an emergent leadership that we can call now uh, the really leadership. And happy here to report that just recently really got registered as an Africa-wide network, uh, really Africa. Next slide. So our impact really is uh, big. You see there, uh, as a network, we celebrate uh, that, that we are influencing in 26,000 schools, reaching over 3 million uh, students, and a network of uh, close to 98,000 teachers. So as 80 member organizations, uh, what we celebrate most is learning and growing together. Uh, that, that really now has emerged as the strongest education network in the region after only five years. The agency and voice of local organizations, now ZZ Africa um, and, and other um, members here would, would bear witness that while we feared at the beginning that we may lose visibility, actually it's the reverse, that because of being together, we now can be listened to and we are more visible. If you imagine one dot that is only on its own on the wall and adding a hundred others, then, then the visibility becomes greater, even to the member organizations. The transformational growth of smaller organizations like where I come from and others, uh, making really visible and making everyone visible, but also growing capacities like the monitoring and evaluation uh, capacities, the capacities to deal with evidence, the capacities to tell our story, but also to attract resources because uh, we are uh, more and bigger. But one story that must be told today is that the Wellspring Philanthropic Fund just from being one funder, uh, we are now celebrating a funder community that um, many others are able to trust because of, of what uh, Wellspring believed in. That risk of getting to trust, giving, seeding power to local organizations has brought now this huge network of, of many of us. Uh, uh, um, uh, achieving impact across East Africa. So next slide, please. What then has made this possible? The first thing, if you just keep clicking, uh, the, the, the first reflection is the power of one funder agreeing to seed power, you know, trust. This uh, trust-based philanthropy that uh, Wellspring risked into. And that journey of patience, because many of us could not understand, we were in competing modes, getting people to believe that we could work together to achieve this. That risk taken by this one funder has really led to all this collaborative energy and uh, that, that is now driving um, the, the, the agency across all of us. When individuals or organizations also trust each other, we know now that collective impact becomes real. We are able to see how the power of working together can become a reality. When I look back in 2018, many of us were still skeptic whether this can be possible. And now we, we see that possibility and even a future where we, 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 we think the only option is, is growing more. The third reflection is about this shared growth, that it is possible. Initially, we would have thought that the, the larger, bigger organizations would actually weaken and swallow the smaller ones, as would be the law of nature. But the reverse has happened, that through the, the larger, stronger organizations, the smaller ones are able to hold, to learn, and to grow. The fourth thing is about the, the, the power of many, uh, that when you are more and you are, then, then you, are, you, you are able to open not just more doors, but bigger doors. People that would ordinarily not listen to us are now able to listen to us. If we were to have more time and share about the story of our policy influencing, you would indeed see that, that, that this has been possible. But that lastly, sustaining work on the African continent necessitates greater trust and support to local leaders. If 
Africa's development is to be led by people who don't reside in this um, a continent, then it is not going to be possible. So we, we are so happy that our agency is growing. And indeed, then, uh, all this is made possible by this community of people who believe, but also funders that believe that doing things differently is the only way. So thank you to, um, to Wellspring, but also other funders that have come in to Echidna Giving, to Lego Foundation, to Imaginable Futures for this great trust. And we can only see now a brighter future as a network. Thank you and back to you, Francois. Thank you so much, uh, John, uh, for that kind of wonderful demonstration, I think, of what we, you know, many of us are, are speaking about and aspire to uh, in, in some of my own work, you know, but through many failures was also coming across, well, how do we really address uh, more systemic change? Uh, and, uh, you know, in the work I, I did with Cynthia was really looking at uh, the, the fact that, you know, we need to entirely change that, that funding paradigm to really distribute agency, build collectives, promote platforms, equip problem solvers to develop their own uh, solutions, uh, and ultimately start to shift that power balance. And you've kind of described that all in, in the Rally Network. Uh, I think everyone is, uh, you know, already excited uh, here to, to learn more. And I encourage you certainly to, to connect with, uh, with John and, um, and, really now to speak a little bit more and bring the perspectives from some of the act other actors in this ecosystem. Um, we are delighted to uh, be joined by uh, Joyce Malombe, who I briefly uh, introduced, uh, that uh, uh, John spoke uh, very uh, kindly about, uh, the Program Director for International Children's Education at the Wellspring Philanthropic Fund. Uh, Alexandra van der Ploeg is here as well, as I mentioned, Head of CSR at SAP. Hi, uh, Alex and Dr. Wamuyu Mahinda, uh, the Managing Partner and Convener of Collaborative Value Partners. You're all connected to Catalyst in some way, part of this ecosystem, uh, either because you've been attracted in or because you've been drawn in uh, and you've all been celebrated, I think, for being you know, important actors in creating this uh, enabling environment. Um, so uh, perhaps uh, Joyce, we'll, we'll start with you because uh, we'd like to hear you know, the other side of, of the story. Uh, you know, this this was a kind of joint award, uh, Catalyst Award uh, for Wellspring for for the way that they've shifted their work. Um, perhaps you can you know tell us a little bit around uh, how did you know what was the background to how did you get to a place where you could you know position yourselves uh, and let go of some of the power that uh, John was talking about to build a true trust based partnership with these kinds of networks. Uh, and what's the biggest impact and value for, for you out of this different way of funding? Thank you, you it's are. a great, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, talking to you about a story that uh, has actually been articulated better than I could ever articulate it. But I just wanted to share where we are coming from. Um, as a World Spring Philanthropic Fund, uh, this program actually was started in 2012 because of the learning, the looming learning crisis, which was global and which looked completely impossible, which looked completely impossible from the African perspective. And so, when we when we chose to focus on East Africa, we just did what you normally do, grant, giving grants, but we realized because this was a new area. These were small organizations trying or interested, but the biggest story was about um, access, not quality education. And so you start this thing and within five years, we had about 60 organizations, all of them doing great small things. And it had become very clear if you were going to put a dent on the learning crisis, the game had to change. And this is where we also realized for sure that we really, uh, we could continue business as usual and do continue funding organizations and, 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 and just say we are doing work or we had to find a new way. And that is when we went back to East Africa to ask the, 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 the we call them implementing partners. They are not our grantees. You know, we, 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 we provide a piece of the solution, but they are the solution that we need. So we went back there to, to ask them and they said we need space to create evidence, 
remember there was more organization. Two, we need um, we need um, a space to collaborate and learn from each other because this was a new thing, a new area in terms of how what works and what doesn't work. And then we need communication support to be able to package our already successful programs and present them to government. Government was um, a partner right from the beginning. We wouldn't fund a, a program that wasn't really linking with the government. It is their children and they are the ones we as a donor realize we can't be the one solving the problem. We can catalyze the solution, but we are not the solution. And that is where the journey began. And uh, I must say here that what it ended up turning out wasn't what we expected. I, somehow we didn't think the competition among organization would be an issue and other things that came up. But the vision was clear, not scaling organization, but scaling impact. For, the, for a sustainable methodology of meeting a very critical need of education because education is the key to everything. And so I think we have worked together. It has been difficult at times, but the difficult wasn't trusting, but the, how do you build a community that has never, we met together for the first time as, uh, uh, in 2017. And so, um, so it has been a journey, but worth it. And then letting people, you know, I mean, as donors, we think we are solving the problem with money, but um, 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 we, we are part of the solution. And that is how we have been willing to walk in uncharted territory and give up that power to the people, uh, to the people to, this is their, their, this is their network, not ours. Our name you can see is not even on it. Thank you. Tell, tell us just quickly a bit about the tension between, you know, previously supporting maybe one or five organizations and, you know, getting education outcomes at the end of each year versus, you know, a much longer term project about building capacity and a, and a big network. Uh, how did you, I mean, how comfortable are you with not being able to see, you know, immediate results at the end of the year? Uh, I just want to clarify that we have continued to fund there because it is evidence-based practice and policy engagement. We have continued to fund their programming as they really work for children. So without evidence, you don't get the government involved. And so um, this other one, we opened a space for them to figure out where we take this agenda. Now that they have the evidence and they are making the evidence. So there was a lot of side support to create and strengthen that evidence and then uh, to, to, to then package it. And then they are the ones who are going to their governments to, to ask for that space. Ours is to support them to, 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 to work together, not to make it happen. And, and my last question to you, Joyce, is how has this influenced you? How, how has it changed the way uh, you know, Wellspring thinks about uh, funding and kind of what value has it created for you uh, as a funder? Um, I think a lot because uh, when we landed there, all we want is impact. We wanted systemic change. We wanted to transform education. We had a very narrow, you know, mandate from from the from 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 from, from, from our spring of really making sure that children go to school, they stay there, they learn, and they thrive. And so this thing has opened an opportunity that was totally unimaginable within months. You could see people getting all of a sudden excited that the, the governments have been the best uh, example of how uh, this has been embraced. So I think for us, it is enabling us to accomplish the very things we wanted to accomplish, but not us, letting those people who are the main players, who are the main beneficiaries, stand on the table and do their thing with our system. So you can see a bit of reversing uh, this way you're thinking. And so children are going to school and they are learning and the people that were supporting them are continuing to support. We can only be a catalyst, a support to the system. And we are privileged to be able to be part of solving the solution, not the ones who are solving the, sol the solution. The thing belongs to us East Africans and they can choose where they want, to, what they want to do with their children in the lo long term. We are just privileged to be part of uh, supporting them to do that. 
Thank you, Joyce, for those really important words. I could listen to you for a, a lot longer, but I, I want to take some of the key elements out of what, what Joyce was talking about, which was um, this element of uh, a, a partnership, this element which you didn't openly speak about, but there's, a, there's an element of, of listening, right? There's an element of understanding, uh, you know, the position you have, the power you have, but then not necessarily using that in ways for, for your own agenda and and really understanding that it does require these actors to to determine their own future, but giving them the support over the long term to do that. Um, I want to turn to Alex now, because there's some elements of the way that Joyce has worked that I see uh, in your work. And uh, of course, uh, you know, you've been driving SAP to be a, a visible uh, leader in the private sector and how it engages with social entrepreneurs and how it's helping to build uh, the social economy. Um, and uh, you know, I'm interested in some of those same dimensions and elements. And obviously, we've been speaking about you know East Africa and education quite specifically. Your work is global. SAP is a global company. Uh, you work with many actors uh, at at different levels. Um, so tell us a little bit around kind of why your approach at SAP and congratulations on your Catalyst Award uh, for for this way of working. Uh, tell us how your engagement with social enterprises is critical uh, and how you help to try and encourage collaboration rather than competition in the sector. Yeah, thank you, Francois. It's been so interesting listening to John and, and Joyce, and I feel that I'm the rookie in the room. Uh, I have so much to learn uh, from all of you here uh, and how you've been approaching the topic of, of partnership and collaboration. Um, and I would love to, to follow up with, with you on that uh, at a later point. Um, but, you know, I think probably as, as it is with so many of these things, um, you know, you, you start typically engaging on a, in a singular approach, in a single way, um, with a particular topic or with an organization. And that was, that was it for us in terms of, you know, working with the social enterprise sector. In the beginning, 12 years ago, we were just working with one incubator in Haiti that was trying to set up a social business incubator um, after the earthquake. Uh, and that was our starting point. And frankly, we knew nothing about social entrepreneurship. We knew nothing about the value that the private sector could provide to the social enterprise sector. And we knew nothing about the value that would be created by us uh, or to us by working with the social enterprise sector. Fast forward 12 years later, we have such a web and network of partners um, on a local, regional, and global level around different topics in social entrepreneurship um, that is sometimes hard to even even grasp. Um, you know everything that that it's that it encompasses. I think that the reason why that happened, though, um, over this twelve-year period of time, is um, is one we really started to see. The, the, the value that social enterprises could, could provide to SAP as a business and not from a CSR perspective. And, you know, I'm sitting here as the head of corporate social responsibility. Um, but I think, you know, the, the true value that the partnership between the private sector and social enterprise sector brings is not around CSR specifically. Of course, there's some elements to it, but it's around um, the business value that's being created. And that operates on different levels. I'm not going to go deeply into that because it gets way too, uh, too complex and, and, and I could talk then for ages. But, but two, two things I want to highlight is we've been, um, we've been building significant pro bono consulting programs to support social enterprises across the world. And what we have seen is that not just does that provide value to the social enterprises that we work with in terms of helping them accelerate um, their business processes and, and make them run better. But even more so, it's provided a very unique experiential learning experience for our employees that is unbeatable. And I, I claim today, and I have the proof point for it, that a pro bono consulting project um, with a social enterprise is probably the highest value you get from a leadership development program. It's a higher value than if you attended Fontainebleau or IMD or any of these other wonderful institutions. <laughs> I hope none of them are here to listen to me say that. Um, so, that so that's one. And then, of course, for us as well, the whole topic of social procurement by social became has become a really, really big, uh, big point. Um, 
but I won't talk too much about that. But what the topic of social procurement has done for us in the last two years is that we realized that we had to move out of this bilateral partnership mode that we were on, um, where we were building all these wonderful partnerships. And we had to start connecting the dots between the partners um, thematically. We've done it primarily on the whole topic of social procurement and by social. Um, and what we're seeing there is that, you know, if you bring, so if you bring the different players to the table, you're able to develop a joint vision, shared goals, and a common action plan. Um, and you're sort of making sure that everybody understands what their place is in it, and you provide value to all of them, uh, and they provide value to this collective. You can go much further than if you did all of these bilateral partnerships. Um, but it is super hard work, I have to admit, <laughs> and I don't think it's always, um, I, I don't think that we should paint a rosy picture in, in terms of how, how that works, right? Because I think if you're not willing to address conflict of interest, if you're not willing to, to see and understand that there might be fears um, and that there might be um, real barriers for organizations to truly collaborate and, and not just say it, but really collaborate and bring the best that they are to the table. If you're not willing to do that, um, you can talk for a while with each other and you can maybe achieve a few things here and there, but ultimately that collective impact that you're striving for as a consortium, as an alliance is not going to happen. Um, and one of the key things that I had to learn in this whole process is um, to not be afraid to pinpoint to the uncomfortable questions and issues that might arise within an alliance, within a network. Um, and I've, I've, I've had to learn that because it's, it's, not, it's not nice to do that, right? You, and you, it's also, you have to trust your gut instinct a little bit with it too, because sometimes you can't pinpoint what it truly is, uh, where the issues lie. Um, but sort of trusting that, that yes, if my gut tells me there's something there, there's conflict of interest, something is not going the way that it should, you have to address it. And you can't just pretend as if it's not there because it will come back and haunt you at some point. Um, anyway, this is just some, some high level um, thoughts um, on my end, but truly for us, uh, what has been the most value add and the most inspiration is, you know, putting that work in, putting the funding on the table as well, to invest in organizations that are building ecosystems uh, and not just individual organizations that have a very, a very clear mission. Um, so working with Catalyst 2030, working with, uh, with the Global Alliance and giving that whole development time and space um, because building ecosystems and networks doesn't happen overnight. Thanks for that. And thanks for also the kind of honesty about you know, the challenges and the conflicts of interest. And I think, you know, when, when we work with private sector, perhaps we're a little bit more sensitive to that, but there are conflicts of interest everywhere. And I think it's important to, to kind of demonstrate that. And I think come into that with an open uh, perspective as you have done um, and, uh, and, 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 and also a listening mindset and attitude that, that you brought to the space. But I think it's also important to demonstrate, you know, social procurement has also been useful to demonstrate, you know, the potential power that private sector can bring that's different from uh, philanthropy, but a potentially very important tool and lever uh, to really build uh, the, the, the the ecosystem and you know deliver real uh, capital and opportunity for for growing some of these initiatives and creating livelihoods and opportunities in more inclusive ways. But at the same time, many people here on the call, including you, me, and many others, also recognize you know the challenge of capitalism that has led to some of these changes, and and there there is this this bilateral effect, mutual effect happening that you're speaking about, you know, the influence on leadership uh, and how, you know, there is a, there is a, you know, a, a, a larger influence than just the, the support to social enterprises themselves that I think, uh, you know, we're cracking the door open to see. So um, thank you, Alex, for, for all your work. I'm going to turn to uh, one of you now, and I'm also just going to encourage the audience, if you have questions, to start putting them in the chat. Some of them will be sent through to me, and after one of you will we'll open up for that. Um, 
Uh, well, we, for uh, many of us, the intersection between government and social entrepreneurs is not always obvious. Uh, and uh, I think the real, very real aspects of saving resources uh, and reaching uh, kind of even deeper than either side could do, similar to the private sector relationships, is not always you know, easy to put together. Um, you have managed you know, to partner with the public sector, which you know, we, I, certainly in my position I often hear is the big obstacle to really thinking about scale or deepening impact or creating systemic change or lasting change. Uh, we all know, you know that that can be the case, and, but it's also very difficult to do. Uh, tell us a bit about um, the, the work you've done with public sector and what the impact was uh, on your work and how you've managed to influence government in, in the ways that they work with other social entrepreneurs. Thank you, Francois. Um, can I have my slide up? Um, we have done quite a bit of work um, as a Kenya Catalyst uh, chapter. And um, the, the, I would say that um, our success has been in rebuilding what we as social entrepreneurs know, because we realize as we work with government that they don't actually know what we do. In fact, when we visit them, they're like social entrepreneurs, who are those? What do you do? I mean, it's really, so we start by like spending a lot of time just explaining that. And then um, we build some kind of a buy-in from government because at the end of the day, it's clear that what we have is what they need. But uh, we need to come to get to a point where we are talking the same language. And it, it's up to us to, should I say, simplify the way we communicate so that it's clear that we have a similar vision. Because even going by the two examples that I have there, we, we have the, the vision of Catalyst 2030. We, we are building, we are, we, are, we, are, you know, we are looking at how we can achieve uh, SDGs. And one of them, for example, is uh, youth employment or develop, you know, youth uh, empowerment. All government offices, whether at county or national level, are all thinking about jobs for youth but they call them jobs for youth. We call them meeting SDG organizations. Some of the organizations we work with are looking at solutions for complex social problems. I mean, the language is different, but we are saying exactly the same thing. So um, just to start with the national level collaboration that we, we had, we wanted to, to, to meet the, the minister for, uh, and the ministry of state department for housing and urban development. And, and that is because we knew that um, they need 10,000 youth to, 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 help, to support the, the, the program, the, 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 you know, the, the one of the programs that is building houses in the informal settlement. And um, we also knew that they were unhappy with the youth that they were getting from the technical institutions because some of the skills that they needed were not you know, in place. Yet one of the Catalyst members, uh, Toolkit iSkills Limited, that is what they do. They upskill and they upskill with, with housing uh, as their focus. So we, Wanted to we, we tried to make that appointment directly. Then we realized, no, no, that's not the way to do it. Let's go to the SME advisory unit because that's the unit that, that knows about SMEs and we are SMEs. And uh, when we explained who we are, what we do, our focus, they're like, oh, guys, that's, we've been looking for you. Where have you been, you know? And uh, they quickly made an appointment for us to meet um, the, the, the State Department of Housing and Urban Development. And uh, as we speak, um, um, our members are, engaged uh, in, in, in this um, ministry. And uh, in fact, in future, they say that um, if they need any skills, they'll start with the social entrepreneurs before they go to consultants, not to mention that some consultants are social entrepreneurs, but anyway, but you can see oh, that, you know, the language bit. Now coming to um, county level, we realized that there are very, we, we, we are very many social entrepreneurs in Kenya. In fact, the membership has 51, but we are many more that are, are yet to become members. And, um, in, in some of the counties, we, ha we, are, we, are, we have um, social entrepreneurs that are making great impact, but they are working in silos, of course. So in this particular program that is um, focusing again on youth jobs, we realized that we needed to bring everybody together in a, in a, in a, in a space, in one space. So we invited the, the county government and the, the, um, the governor herself. We brought in our, our donor partner, who is the, the Dutch um, Ministry of, um, of Foreign Affairs, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, as well as all the business organizations, that's Chamber of Commerce, Nakuru Business Association, Kenya Association members, and they came with their members. 
And when the discussion was clear that we are actually saying the same thing, the next thing was, how do we do this? And, and, and I want to say that what made all this possible is having a field catalyst, somebody who understands how to put this together. And that's what catalysts, I mean, the uh, members of Catalyst 2030 are doing. Because we understand collaboration better than so many other people. We are there for those people who are bringing others together. We are those people who are ensuring that the community, the people around us are uh, coming together, even with the difficulties that uh, Alexandra mentioned of conflict. They're there, conflict is there. Uh, we, we have different visions. We are trying to marry our visions because they're not exactly the same. But it is possible when you want to do it, because then you go out of your way to put to put away your personal interest and look at this big picture that you want um, to to address. We all want our youth employed. So what, what what is my vision, you know, and why should it be a, a problem to this discussion? So then um, at that point we come together and we bring our other partners and we are able to do this together. In accord with the social entrepreneurs, especially the ones in business, have said. We are, one of the field catalysts um, is, is got a mechanism that is going to turn youth into retailers. So the manufacturers all signed up and said, we are going to form the basket, the basket that the retailers will be, will be you know, sto the stock, the stock for their little shops where they are retailers. And, and, and that um, will employ over 10,000 youth. I mean, it's, it's the collaboration makes it, not easy, but possible to get very many young people employed. Thanks. Uh, th thanks, Mori. I, I, th this really important role of the platform you're building, right, to bring voice to many smaller organizations, I think is critical and also, you know, and, and doing the trust building, relationship building, network building is critical to then actually get the real perspectives, you know, to overcome some of these barriers, you know, if there is a supporter or funder or donor wanting to work on a particular issue just to go to the large organization that's already doing this. What you're doing is creating the platform uh, for that engagement or whether it's engagement with government. I think it's a critical, important role. And as we know, quite difficult to articulate to people, to tell people why it's important and, and even to fund. So um, I, I, I wanna go now and, and we'll get some questions in, uh, to this panel, but um, uh, I've got one uh, that's uh, been submitted to me and maybe we can also bring John in if he's still there. Uh, to, into this uh, discussion. Um, so welcome back, John. Uh, the question we have, which is actually really important, we've seen a huge uh, sophistication of measurement tools and impact and the request for kind of measuring impact, which I think has been really important uh, over the last couple of decades so that we know and we're accountable for the work that we all do. Uh, but how is measurement becoming a practical barrier uh, to collaboration? Uh, and are there any bright spots in, way, in the ways in which measurement and learning is being used actually to help fuel collaboration? Do any of you want to try and tackle that? Yeah, Francois, if I can Please come in. Me. Yeah, uh, we, as really, really we have, uh, this is one of the questions that we have tried to tackle measurement. And when we started, uh, a lot of framing of on uh, foundational learning was actually literacy and numeracy. And we knew that our children in Africa needed more, you know, you know than, than, than just being able to read and count. So we knew there was a bigger problem of measurement, a bigger uh, challenge that we had to face uh, as, as, as Africans. And this was a measurement of... Um, these these complex competences like problem solving or collaboration and and so what we were now able to do through a process of you know being many and encouraging each other you, you know we were able to dare uh, very difficult work uh, that we have been doing over the years of developing measurements in context. What does problem solving mean in the context of Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda? And how does one get to measure these uh, kind of difficult things? Because we know that unless if we measure them, then they won't get attention from government or from anyone else. Unless if we have evidence, it won't be possible. So um, um, we, we have been on a journey of 40 weeks learning how to and saying that we won't use any tools developed in the global north and just adapt them. We will use the 
past that difficult route of learning how to develop them ourselves and developing them in context. And I'm glad to report that this August, we now just uh, completed the assessment, reaching uh, um, over 46,000 adolescents in 37,000 households. This would not have been possible for a single organization. I, I think these, these catalyzing ideas, but I think also catalyzing courage because when little carriages connect, then this big courage through this, we are able to do very difficult things. And this is what we celebrate as really. Thank you. Thank you, John, and giving that, that you know, message to all of us to have, to have courage to step away, you know, some of the things that we hold dear uh, and you know, even bring a wonderful example around measurement as, as a learning tool, which of course we know it is, but really letting go if we really want more systemic changes, these longer term, uh, outcomes that, uh, you know, focusing perhaps measurement on the process of, of how we're getting there, uh, rather than, you know, the outcomes at the end of the school year alone uh, is going to help us, you know, and what is the capacity we're building to do this kind of deeper, more transformative work over time. Um, I, I have one more question uh, that has come up and perhaps uh, someone else uh, from the group, uh, and, and it's actually a great question. So I think uh, we all have been in this, uh, you know, on one side, perhaps, or the other of uh, what, what the, 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 the question here is calling solution favoritism. Uh, so there's a common challenge uh, when trying to be impactful of, you know, in terms of which solutions uh, are the ones uh, that should be supported uh, and how do implementation organizations and proximate levers overcome these challenges when there are other you know, important solution and resourceful ideas out there. Does anyone have experience or want to share uh, a learning around that? I can maybe make the start um, on that. I think one of the approaches that we have taken is that we actually don't try to claim that we think what we know the winning solution is and then sort of put all of our eggs into that one basket. So sort of when you sort of look at the whole topic of social procurement, for example, we've spread our net and our love in terms of funding very wide. <laughs> um, and that's just because we what we saw is that there was a lot of energy and a lot of excitement and movement around the topic. So basically what we decided to do is fund that energy and that excitement and that creativity. Um, and then just let people, you know, let people run with it. Um, and frankly, what you then see is that, yes, there might be solutions that are very, very similar, but then you can come to a point where you can bring it back together again. Um, so, I mean, that's one approach that, that we have taken is just to sort of not think that we, that we know what the winning solution could potentially be, but just let creativity and innovation flow. Joyce, you wanted to come in as well? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, I think once we get to the understanding that the issue here isn't competition of which solution beats another solution, then we are out to figure out what are the emerging patterns that would enable us to get where we want to go. And so, of course, it was very difficult because the bigger organizations, uh, of course, um, they, they, they tend to take over. But we are saying, as John was explaining there earlier on, each person's solution matter and how do we bring the how do we come together and find a path because they, they, they have support to find their own, their own initiatives but this support is to create a collaborate a collaborative space where they can be able now to carry this together and so they, they also found that these smaller organizations are completely in the woods and they are there in the weeds and they are there getting it whatever and helping with the solution. So we all need each other if we can find a language, at least in education, to, to, to speak that would enable us bring our issues together because we want children to learn. So it, it, is, um, um, it is hard to, to, to just say my idea was good, but maybe we go here. But there is a search for the solution. If we had solutions, we would actually just go to that, to that solution and do it. We are looking and learning together. This perspective, Joyce, I think is very important for the smaller organizations that, you know, that are that are there, that are often closest to, you know, where, where context and things are different and where one, 
you know, solution that may be even proven by an evidence is not necessarily the same when rolled out in all different contexts. So creating space for that, I think, is really important. Uh, Nancy has an important question here, uh, which I'm just going to raise, but I don't think we have time to fully answer, but she's asking about how uh, we work with groups to get a sense of what transformative could be, uh, what could be transformative and what is not in a system. I think that's a kind of a, a, a big a big question, Nancy, but thank you for that. Um, I think what we hope to do today uh, is really just give a flavor of uh, the importance of creating space, of creating networks uh, to allow local solutions to emerge, to be supported uh, with an enabling environment to overcome some of the patterns uh, and the power uh, challenges that we've had over decades to really unleash uh, you know, self-determination, to unleash agency in people, uh, to change the, the patterns of uh, um, dependency, uh, and to really um, you know, work in ways that, that are anew. Uh, and it's happening. It's happening all around us. I'm sure many of you on this call as well are, are looking for ways to work differently. Um, so, you know, just to, to sum up briefly, um, uh, Catalyst 2030 is trying to create the space for these conversations, to, to create space to, to learn, to find different partners, to continue to work with, to, to understand each other, uh, and ultimately to really focus and has a big focus on building collaborative networks, because that's we believe is a really important uh, mode and, and tool of getting towards these more systemic changes. Um, you know, and starting to shift that paradigm from funding uh, just the symptoms of these failing systems uh, to rather building capacity for resilience uh, and, uh, and, and, and self-determination. Uh, so um, we've listened to uh, some of the social enterprises, the uh, nonprofits uh, that have been not only on this call, but actually thousands across the Catalyst network. They've come together and signed a, a letter um, which I think uh, the team are going to um, post here, uh, which is the call to action letter around shifting funding practices. It's really a perspective from uh, partners uh, on the ground who are wanting to work with uh, funders in different ways and giving the ways in which they think is going to enable them to do their work better. So do look at that, uh, become a partner uh, of Catalyst 2030 if you want to kind of engage in some of these conversations. Um, there is also what might be uh, useful um, for uh, many of you who are donors on the call, there is a donor learning group, which is a safe space for donors. Uh, there are different uh, speakers that are brought in uh, and different discussions held around kind of how to fund uh, more systemically uh, and to share some of the different practices, challenges, uh, internal uh, barriers to, to doing that kind of work. Um, uh, I mentioned the, 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 the letter. There will also be a funder pledge that actually comes out of that letter. Uh, and uh, the team here will follow up on that. If you think you're wanting to start working these ways, you're already working in these ways, uh, and you want to learn more about that, uh, the, the, the team will send this. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, do join the Catalyst membership uh, to start to connect and collaborate with other funders, but also other uh, networks, uh, partners, and social entrepreneurs uh, in this community. Um, we've just put up a, a session poll. So uh, if you'd like to give us a little feedback on that, please do. Um, and as we're on time, I'm going to try and uh, end us and, and letting you know who to contact here uh, at the Secretariat, uh, Matthew Patton, uh, who just opened up the call at the beginning, uh, the Donor Relations Facilitator, and Lindsay Ritchie, uh, who works with him, uh, the Donor Relations uh, Lead. So join the movement, um, you know, figure out uh, ways in collaborating with some of the people in this incredible network, uh, and actually start to bring your ideas and perspectives into how we shift uh, the paradigms that we are often find ourselves stuck in. But we see those of us in this community, some uh, really important flowering moments uh, and opportunities to, to work together to change it. Uh, let's keep both the skepticism uh, that Alexandra brought with us, which is healthy to be kind of self-critical around the work we do, but also the amazing uh, hope and opportunity that we also heard from, from all of our panelists. So a big thanks to uh, to Joyce, to John, to Amulya, to, to Alex uh, for joining today and, uh, and being part of this first impact showcase. Uh, thanks to you all for joining us today and uh, we look forward to following up with all of you.